the children to Sunday school. Let's pray for them as they go. I'd like you to take your Bibles, turning with me to the book of Mark this morning. The second of the Gospel records, Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. The book of Mark tells us what the Lord, that the Lord went about doing good. He went about as a servant. He sowed so many wonderful seeds. He went about doing good. He went about doing miracles. And the Bible tells us this passage, in this passage, one of His greatest miracles. There's so many miracles that the Lord Jesus did. And those miracles teach us a lesson. We've been learning about that in our Bible school lesson. But this morning we're going to, we're going to learn about how the Lord Jesus has had power over blindness. And the title of the message this morning is, once, I once was, law, once was blind, but now I see. I once was blind, but now I see. The great song, Amazing Grace. Uh, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found was blind, but now I see. And that's where the title of the message comes from. Let's read together from Mark chapter 10, verse, starting in verse 46. Verse 46. And they came to Jericho. And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried the more a great deal, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith has made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for the fact that the Lord Jesus is with us even today. Father, I pray that that, uh, that can be true of our church. It doesn't matter the size of our church. It just matters and how many people are here, but it does matter that you're with us. Father, we ask that you would meet with our, our congregation. We know that you promised that wherever two or three are gathered together, you'd be in the midst, and we know that you are here because the Holy Spirit lives inside of each believer here today. But Father, we pray that He'll, uh, that as He tries to, to manifest Himself, to speak to our hearts, that You'll help us to see, may we not have blindness to what the Holy Spirit would have to speak to our hearts this morning. Father, we thank You for His help, and we ask for His blessing, the Holy Spirit. So Father, we, we uh, pray for, uh, for a special day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Now, this past Monday, Natalie and I were in London uh, after we were at uh, uh, Down and Baptist Church in, in Lewisham. And the pastor took us to central London, the very center. The, there's 32 boroughs plus the city of London in the, in the middle. So we went to the city of London. And right there in the city of London, there's an old church. It's one of the only churches. It's the only church that didn't get damaged by the Nazis in the raid. But it's called St. Mary Woolnoths. And that's the church where John Newton pastored for 27 years. John Newton, the former slave captain who became a Christian off the coast of, uh, off the northeast, uh, northwest coast of Scotland in a big storm. And he came to the Lord Jesus Christ and he, he once had been blind. And yet then he, now he was able to see. And he, he became a Christian and, and he, he wanted to give his life to the Lord. He was always uh, a bit like, like the testimony of Brother Bernard. He was always saying, I... I'm not worthy to be a Christian. I'm not worthy to be a pastor, but he was a pastor. He was a humble man, and so he was the only Anglican. He was an Anglican, but he was an evangel. He was the only Anglican in in London who was an evangelical Anglican who preached the, the gospel, who preached the the Bible at the time. 
And so uh, lots of people would come and hear John Newton preach. In fact, uh, they used to try, the other churches used to try to get John Newton's schedule changed. So he'd preach somewhere else so that they could handle all the crowds, you know. And they, they didn't like him at all, uh, the other pastors in London, because they were jealous of his crowds and they, they thought he was uh, a bit backwards. But, you know, he never talked about slavery until he was older. And as he was starting to go blind, he had a young man in his in his congregation named William Wilberforce who wanted to quit politics and John Newton said no you, you, you can stay in politics and you can make a difference and he of course is the one who abolished slavery but John Newton about that time also started to go blind as he pastored that church in London and uh, he but he was able to write while he was there this song I once was blind but now I see he find he found real uh, real sight and you know what this story here in Mark chapter 10 is a similar case of irony. Mark likes to use irony in his book. And in this book we see the crowds of people who can see physically but they cannot see spiritually. And yet we see a blind man who is blind physically but he can see spiritually. He knows who Jesus is. He knows the, the truth about, about it. And so that last not line of, of amazing grace that we quoted earlier uh, that really also suggests that uh, the physical miracle of Jesus here, of restoring sight to a blind man, uh, is, is the same as Jesus' healing of our spiritual blindness. Jesus did all these miracles. You know, Christianity, we, Christianity is one of the only, uh, we, it's, the, it's only faith, really, that makes such a big deal about miracles. Other religions, they don't really see the need in miracles so much. They, but Christianity, we know uh, the world as it really is. We can see the world in its natural state. It's something sinful. It's something fallen. It's something that's cursed, the world that we live in. We need the Lord Jesus to take us out of that. One day, the, one day He's going to remove the curse, and, but the only person who's going to be able to do that is the Lord Jesus Christ, and He proved that He's the one who could do that by doing miracles. Amen. And so the Lord Jesus Christ, He did miracles. Amen. And all the miracles that the Bible records throughout the whole Bible, really they're pointing to the greatest miracle. The greatest miracle of all was that Jesus Christ was made a man. God became a man. And He did the, He came to do, and he, he did more miracles than anyone. He was God becoming a man. 1 Timothy 3.16, famous verse, it says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, God was manifest in the flesh. Amen. I read that verse to a Jehovah's Witness at, at uh, Natalie's sister's home this week, and that God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in the glory. That really, that one verse just sums up all Jesus' life. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in the into glory. He was, the Holy Spirit was justifying who he was by allowing him to do these great miracles. And so, these miracles are pointing to something. They, all, of, all of the miracles in the Bible point to Jesus, the ultimate miracle, his incarnation, so that, he could, so that he could bring salvation to the world. But then Jesus himself went about doing miracles, and all of those miracles point to something. You know, the miracles in the Bible, we've learned in the Bible school, they're not just some sort of shotgun pattern just, uh, uh, just uh, to, to wow us about Jesus. No, but they, they have a theme. All the miracles together have a theme. And they point to the fact that He can save our souls. You know, He healed the man with leprosy. We have spiritual leprosy. We're eaten up with it. He healed the man who was impotent, who couldn't walk. He heals us. We can't, walk, we can't walk to God. We can't make our own way to God. He healed the, the man who, couldn't, who uh, couldn't see. You know, we also have spiritual blindness. All the miracles in the Bible point to some, some aspect. All the, all the miracles of healing in the Bible point to some aspect of our sinful state. Our sinful state. You know, some people think, well, I'm not that bad. I'm not as bad as a, a man with putrefying sores and leprosy and all that. But uh, Jesus is trying to say, you are that bad. Amen. We all have this, the curse inside of us. We're all sinners. Amen. Amen. Every single one of us. You know, there was a, a man named Adolf Eichmann. He was a Nazi, and he escaped. He got to South America. And in the 60s, they caught Adolf Eichmann. I think it was 1961. And they tried him for what he had done. 
And uh, at the trial, they brought in a Jewish man who had been in the concentration camp with uh, uh, where Adolf Eichmann was in charge. And uh, he was supposed to give a testimony. And uh, the Jewish man, when he saw that man, that Nazi man, he started weeping uncontrollably. And uh, afterwards they interviewed him and they, they said, I'm sure that was emotional for you. And he said, well, I wasn't crying because of what, he's, what he did. I wasn't crying because of all the memories it brought back. He said, I was crying because I looked at him and he looked like a normal man. Mm. And he said, there was a little bit of, hit of Eichmann in me. If he's capable of that, I'm capable of that. And he said to the, to the cameras, he said, uh, there's a little bit of Eichmann in all of us. You know, that's true. Amen. There's a little Amen. bit of, uh, of there, there's a lot of it, actually. Yeah. There's, a, there's, a, there's a sinful nature that we all have. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need the Lord Jesus Christ. We need the, this, this spiritual miracle mm -hmm. because we're blind. All of us are blind to some things. We're all blind to Jesus Christ when, we're, when we come naturally into this world. But the Lord Jesus opens our eyes to see him. But other cases as well, we're all blind to something, some things throughout our life. We're blind to what the Lord's trying to do in our lives. And we need the Lord to open our eyes. You know, you may have been open, the Lord may have been able to, to have opened your eyes so that you could see the Lord Jesus Christ for who he really was and to be saved. But perhaps there's other things that the Lord wants to show you from his word that you, your eyes are closed to, that you don't see. So I pray that God can do this miracle in each one of us. That's what Paul prayed in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. He prayed for the Ephesians, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. You know, he says that the eyes of your understanding, that's what we have. We have eyes of our heart. Eyes of our heart. Eyes of our understanding. They need to be opened. And uh, the, the eyes of our heart, that's where our, our emotions are, our feelings, but our spiritual heart as well. May our spiritual eyes be open today. Amen. Well, the Bible tells us that we are blind. Um, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4 says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. <clears throat> they have physical sight, but he's blinded their minds, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, which is the image of God, should shine unto them. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ, He had such pity on, on the people that He saw. You know, He was the perfect one. He was, he, he was in heaven where there's no sin, where there's no sickness, no sorrow, no crying. And yet He came to the earth. He became acquainted with grief, the Bible tells us in Isaiah 53. He became a man of sorrows as he looked around at this world that is cursed. So when Jesus saw a blind man, it reminded him of the fact that the earth is sinful, that they've turned away from him. That, that, that that's, a, that's just an outward expression of what's really wrong with, with everybody in the world. So he had such pity when he saw these people. So he couldn't see somebody with a sickness without healing them. Uh, without healing them. Of course, the, uh, he, but he did it for specific reasons, to prove who he was and to prove that he could heal them spiritually as well. And, uh, of course, he wanted them to, their faith to be involved in all of that. But he, you know, nowadays we have hospitals and there's waiting times and, and uh, you know, there's uh, big long queues and, and uh, there's tests that have to be done and diagnoses and all these things. But with Jesus, none of that had to happen. He just healed them straight on the spot. Because he Amen. created all things, Amen. he could just reverse it I mean, instantly. People who had palsied hands, who, people who could never walk, who, who's, who had atrophy, I'm sure, their, their bones would grow, their, their flesh would grow back into place. He was doing creative works, eyes they couldn't see. He, he created new eyes. The eyes are so complex, and yet the Lord Jesus Christ could do that. Amen. He did it. Amen. And so the Lord Jesus Christ performed a miracle for this, this man, Bartimaeus. Now, why? What, what, what was so important about Bartimaeus? Bartimaeus, he was blind. The Bible says there in verse number 46 that he sat by the road, by, he sat by the highway side begging. He sat by the highway side begging. And as he sits by the highway side, it says, verse 47, And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus Thou son of David, have mercy on 
me. Amen. Just Amen. want you to think about blind Mark Bartimaeus, that he was blind, but he saw Jesus mm -hmm. for who he was. He was a beggar. They Blind people back then, they didn't have any sort of guide dogs or braille or anything like that. Uh, they could never work any type of job whatsoever. They were just relied on the pity of other people. And so he sat there by the road. Uh, the Bible says he had his coat. I'm sure he, he, he spread that coat across his knees to catch any money that might be thrown towards him. And, uh, but yet, when he heard Jesus had come, he knew who Jesus was. How did he know? How did he know? The Bible tells us that he, he started crying out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Amen. So this, that, that tells us that Bartimaeus knew that this Jesus of Nazareth was the promised son of David, the Messiah, the Christ, the one who was going to come and for, forgive sins and set all things right once again. He knew that he was the one who could have mercy, and when God shows mercy, he knew it would make a difference Amen. in his life. He knew he was a sinner. He knew uh, that he was uh, a beggar. You know, the Bible tells us that he was at the back of the crowd. People were passing him by. People at the front of the crowd were telling him to be quiet. He was at the back of the crowd because in those days, people used to think, in, in the ancient days, people used to think that if you were blind, you must have committed some terrible sin that made you blind, which isn't necessarily true at all. But, uh, but he, he would have been an outcast. He would have been looked down upon. And so uh, the Lord Jesus, uh, the Lord Jesus was the son of David, the famous Messiah, the, the Christ who was coming. And he must have heard something about the Lord Jesus as he sat there by the roadside, people talking. And uh, he, he believed. And uh, he, he became certain that Jesus could do anything. You know, the book of Isaiah tells us that Jesus, that this baby who was going to be born, the Messiah one day, he was going to be, uh, he's going to be called uh, the Mighty God the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, uh, Wonderful Counselor, all those great names that Jesus was given. And, you know, uh, this lady who I met at the care, the care place uh, this week from Nigeria, she said, well, yeah, Jesus is a God, but he's not, he's not the Mighty God. Mm -hmm. So I was able to take her to that verse in Isaiah that says he's called the Mighty God, the Amen. Everlasting Amen. Father. You know, mm -hmm. he's, there's... You know, they, 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 they add the word A to John 1.1, 1, 1, the, the Watchtower magazine. And it says, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. You know, I've seen all the Greek things in, in Bible college. None of them have the word A. None of them. And yet they added a word to the Bible to make it make, make sense to them. So they were, she was saying, you believe in three gods. And I said, no, I believe in one God, in three persons. You actually believe in two gods because you say Jesus is just a God. So how, he must be a second God. He must be, be an inferior God. And she said, well, yeah, that's right. He's just a, he's, he's a God, but he's not the mighty God. But he was. And Bartimaeus knew it. He knew this was someone who could do anything. And he knew it. So he started crying to the Lord, and he knew that the Lord Jesus Christ could do something for him. He could give him his sight if he, if he would, if he would just have mercy on him. You know, which, which part of the, the, the crowd do you fall into this morning? Bartimaeus saw Jesus, but he was blind. And yeah, I said the irony of the crowds was that they were seen, but they were spiritually blind. The Bible says they were, by the way, uh, look at, um, look at verse, verse number... Uh, the end of verse 46 is again, it says, Barnabas is sitting by the highway side begging. But when he sees Jesus coming along, Jesus passes by. It says the people who were at the front, this is from the book, book of Luke, the same story in the book of Luke chapter 18, verse 39. It says, and they which went before rebuked him that he should hold his peace. But he cried so much the more. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. The people who were in front of him in the crowd, they weren't on the way, they were just standing next to the road, and they were rebuking him. They were saying, be quiet. Be quiet. You're just, uh, you're just a nobody. You're just a beggar. You know, the, there's so many, so many people in life, they are just by the side of the road. You know, for them, Jesus is passing by, but Jesus is just somebody that they can, they can look at. They can talk about him. They can... They could see him as he walks by, but but uh, but Bartimaeus he didn't want to just sit there as Jesus passed by. He didn't just want to hear about Jesus. He didn't just want to 
know about Jesus and talk about Jesus. He wanted to be on the way with Jesus. He wanted Jesus to stop. He wanted Jesus to, to, to save him. You, know, you might be here. You might know about Jesus. You might have heard about You might have talked about Jesus to your friends. We met a man at the, at the funeral uh, yesterday, and he used to be called, his name is Russell, and he said before he was a Christian, his friends called him Rabbi Russell, because he at the pub, he would always talk about religion, but he wasn't saved, he wasn't a Christian. And he would talk about Jesus, but he didn't know Jesus. Amen. And he told Amen. us about how one day he finally, uh, he, his, his wife uh, was being, uh, starting to take some Bible studies with the Jehovah's Witnesses. And so he, um, he uh, had um, been delivering ice cream, and so he was supposed to deliver ice cream to a, a Baptist Bible school. And uh, the Baptist Bible School here, they, uh, they called him up and uh, they said, um, we want you to deliver some ice cream. So he got there and they said, nobody, nobody asked you to, nobody called, nobody asked you to have ice cream. And so uh, he said, well, that's very strange. But while he, while he was there, he said, well, is anybody here who can tell me about these uh, Jehovah's Witnesses? Because my wife's having Bible studies. And then the principal of the school, a few minutes later, when he was sitting with him in his office and telling him about the gospel and led him to the Lord. And the Lord found him. You know, before that he was just on the side of the road talking about Jesus. But we need to we not we don't just be on the side. We don't just need to be on the on the on the side of the road. We need to be in the way. Right. Look what it says in, in the last verse of the chapter. It says, And follow Jesus in the way. Bartimaeus finally was in the he wasn't just on the side. We don't just need to be on the side. Jesus is passing by. We need to we need to to realize that. So where are you? Now, following Jesus on the way isn't easy. You know, the Bible says that there's two ways. There's a broad way and there's a narrow way. The Bible says there's few that go in at the narrow gate and go on the narrow way, but there's many that go in at the broad gate and walk on the broad way. That leads to destruction. And the narrow way leads to life everlasting. But why are there so few people on the narrow way and so many people on the broad way? Well, it's because the narrow way, following Jesus on this way, isn't an easy thing. Why are so many on the road to destruction? Because it's easy to be on the road to destruction. You just, you're already on the road to destruction. You just continue on the way to destruction. You might see the narrow way. You might see other people on the narrow way. You might talk about it, but you need to actually change which road you're on. Because the destinations are totally different. You need to change the way. So, you know, uh, following on the way, it's hard with Jesus. It means there's spiritual warfare. It means there's, there's going to be hardships, there's going to be trials, but, but you're a son of God. You're a daughter of God on the way with Him. And He's training you with these things, that this spiritual warfare. He's, he's bringing, if you didn't have any of these hardships, you might not even be one of His children. Because the Bible says without, without uh, those, those tests and trials and chastening, then you might not really be one of His sons in Hebrews chapter uh, 13. Chapter 12 and 13. And so, we need to realize, which, what's my identity? Am I on the way, or am I trying to get on the way like Bartimaeus, or am I just standing by on the side? You know, Satan, it's all about our identity. Where are we? Satan, he would said to, uh, he said to Jesus, if thou be the Son of God. He said, if, he said, and then he was trying to attack who he really was. And Eve, you know, he, he attacked her identity. He says, you, you can be as gods, you know, if you, if you come over to this way. Well, uh, he's trying to do the same for you. He might say to you, you don't need this Bible. Uh, you're, people think too high of themselves. People think too high of themselves. I don't need that Bible. I don't need, be, need to be accountable to God. I don't need any of that stuff. They think too highly of themselves. But there's other people who think too lowly of themselves. Maybe, maybe uh, Bartimaeus could have been tempted to think too lowly of himself. People say to us nowadays, you know, you're just a, you're just a uh, an animal. You know, you, you can do whatever you want. Just go into go into your uh, your cravings and your sinful desires. Your that's all you are. But uh, but we need the Lord Jesus Christ. We shouldn't think too highly of ourselves, thinking we don't need Him. We shouldn't think too lowly of ourselves, thinking we're just uh, an animal. The Lord Jesus Christ, He He wants you to know you are a child. You're you're someone who He created. He wants you to He wants to save. He wants to make you one of His children, and then you can be on the way with Him. Amen. And so, Jesus is passing by. What are you going to do? Are you going to stay on the way that you're in? Are you going to continue? Are you going to follow Him? You know, the, the Bartimaeus here, he wanted the Lord Jesus. He, uh, these crowds, you know, he was there with the crowd. Crowds are always good news for beggars, but uh, 
He didn't care about the crowds. He wasn't saying, hey, hey, everybody in the crowd, give me some money. He wasn't doing what he normally did. He was crying out for Jesus. Amen. He was crying Amen. out for him. You know, there's crowds of people in our lives. So many people crowd Jesus out. They're just too busy to think about it. But don't crowd him out. Focus on him. There's so many things that we can look at in life. So many things that the devil uses. Big shining lights to distract us from him. But don't be blind to Jesus. Let, let him just see him. That's what Bartimaeus said. He saw him, not, not anybody else, in his mind's eye. He couldn't use his eyes, but he used his voice. And he started shouting even more loudly, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. His prayer was really short. But uh, that's a prayer of, uh, that's, a, that's a sinner's prayer, isn't it? Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. Like that publican in the temple who knew he was a sinner, he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He beat his breast. He knew he needed God. And so that's, that's all you have to pray to the Lord Jesus. You have to know you're a sinner. You have, to, you have to know your need. You have to know that Jesus can meet that need. Put your faith in him. You know, he just threw himself into Jesus' hands. He knew Jesus could save him. He didn't care what anybody else thought. And that's what you need to do. If you're not a Christian, just throw yourself into Jesus' arms. Amen. You can do that at death. At death, you can just die and just fall and know Jesus will catch you and know he'll take you to heaven. Amen. The Bible says that, that the angels carried Lazarus into Abraham's bosom when he died. And, and he died with sweet happiness and calmness, I'm sure, compared to the rich man in his, in his mansion, tossing and turning on his deathbed, worried about the future. But we can... We can do that. One night a, a house caught on fire and a young boy had to run to the roof. He couldn't get down. He was in the top of the house. And so the father stood on the ground with his arms outstretched saying, Son, just jump. I'll catch you. And the boy, he knew he had to jump to save his life. But, but he, all he could see was the smoke and the flames and the blackness below. And, uh, he, you know, as you can imagine, he was afraid to leave that roof. Mm -hmm. But his father kept shouting, I'll catch you, just jump, I can see you. Uh, he says, I can't, the, the boy said, I can't see you, but the, the dad said, I can see you, and that's all that matters, just jump, Amen. and he jumped. Amen. You know, that's true, you know, we can't see God in this life, but he can see us. And he's told us, all we have to do is fall in faith, trust in him. Trust the Lord Jesus Christ, and He'll catch you. Uh, he'll, he'll save you. He'll give you a new life. And so, uh, there's some lessons here for us. You know, Bartimaeus, he welcomed Jesus' coming. We should welcome His coming. You know, as sinners, we should welcome His coming and be excited. Some, some people are really hesitant to be saved, but we need to let them know. Think about Bartimaeus. He knew it was going to be amazing when he got his sight. He was excited about it, and, and he got to see things he had never seen in his whole life. He got to see the trees and the sky and everything. It was a whole new world for him, and same with Christ. Come to Christ, and it's going to be a whole new world for you. And uh, people need to see that. But the same thing's true uh, after we're saved. Do we welcome when Jesus comes to us and, and tries to convict us about things and help us to see the full picture of the Christian life? Do we welcome him when he comes and tells us some things that we are, are wrong about? When the, when the preacher is preaching and he points his, and the Holy Spirit points his finger on something in your life that you've tried to keep hidden in a dark closet of your heart, and uh, you say, no, no, I don't want Jesus to come, and he's not welcome in that closet. <laughs> but we, we should welcome him when he passes by Amen. in a sermon, or when he passes by when you're reading the Word of God. We should welcome him in. Open up your whole house. Open up all the closets and all the windows. Let them, let them see. We should welcome them in to our hearts. You know, uh, we need to realize this is the greatest opportunity that we'll ever have uh, when Jesus passes by. And uh, we need to take advantage of those opportunities. And we need to be hungry for Him to come. You know, so Bartimaeus, he welcomed Jesus' coming. You know, the second thing, he was persistent when Jesus came. He, he wasn't easily put off. You know, he could have been put off by his weakness. He could have been put off by the crowd. You know, he, people said to be quiet. He could have said, okay, okay, I'll be quiet. But he didn't. He shouted even louder. Amen. Amen. He was determined. You know, don't be put off by anything when it comes to when Jesus is passing by. Get to him no matter what. Make your way to him. You know, uh, don't, don't, don't be hesitant if you're not a Christian. Come to him right now. He's, this is the greatest opportunity you will ever have. 
and you need to be saved. And if you're a Christian, don't put anything off. You know, you can be, you can be even more like Christ. You can be a Christ-like person. You, you have this, life is so short, and we have just this moment. You know, God's left us here for a reason. Amen. And uh, Amen. If, if He did, if, you know, He could have taken you straight to heaven. You could be there right now. I'm sure you could be doing uh, a lot better things in heaven right now than you are here on the earth. I'm sure you could be serving the Lord in heaven, doing some wonderful, amazing things in, in, uh, in, in, in the infinite space up there in heaven. And so, but he, you're not. You're here. God's left you here. And so, don't waste any time. Come straight to the Lord Jesus. You know, people might say to you, people might try to put you off if you're a Christian, saying, you know, you don't really have to be that extreme. You don't really have to follow the Lord Jesus that much. But look at what it says here in, uh, in Mark chapter 10, verse... 50. It says, And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. Mm. That garment, as he sat there on the, on the roadside, he sat there and he spread that coat across his knees and people would throw the money into that. That was his only hope of, of living and his only hope of livelihood. But he didn't care. He just trusted Jesus. He threw, threw that coat to the side he says, I don't know, Jesus will take care of me, and he got up and ran to the Lord Jesus. He didn't care about the money or anything else. Same with you as a Christian. You should say, I don't know about what my livelihood will be if I become a Christian. If I maybe the Lord's calling you into some sort of ministry, say, I don't care, I'm just gonna let the Lord take care of me. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to cast it off to the side? I remember my grandma was so mad at me for uh, or uh, actually my guidance counselor really was was more mad at the at the at the public school because she got me all these scholarships to go to the university and I said no I'm going to Bible college mm. she said you're throwing your life away my guidance counselor and you're throwing all these scholarships away and uh, but that was the furthest thing from I just knew I just wanted to follow the Lord Jesus in the way Amen. I wanted to serve Amen. him and so Amen. hopefully you also are not easily put off from following Jesus and if other people scorn you just keep going you know, maybe that they too will be seeking him before long. Jesus uh, stopped. He stopped. And uh, if, if you are seeking the Lord and he's passing by, he'll stop for you. Lord Jesus Christ, he, was, he didn't care about uh, all the other people in the crowd. There's people there who were, who were excited. About, this is the last week. of Je this is, uh, He's going to Jerusalem. Jericho is 15 miles from Jerusalem. And he's on his way to his final week, to his death. And so he never really been, spent much much time in Jericho, so there were people there, kind of like the, if it was if it was in the 21st century, it'd be kind of like the paparazzi. I'm sure they'd be taking pictures of Jesus and trying to get a selfie maybe with Jesus, or who knows, but uh, I'm not trying to uh, be uh, uh, profane here, but, uh, but, the, but the Lord Jesus didn't care about any of those other people. He saw somebody there who was crying out for him, and he stopped. He stopped for that man. You know, uh, we don't need to think about any any of the other things in the world, the big lights. We need to just say, I want the Lord. And it's going to be better than anything I ever imagined. He stopped. Amen. Amen. And Jesus said to him, He said, uh, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? What if the God the Creator asked that to you? What do you want me to do for you? What would you say? Solomon was asked that question. What would you like? And uh, he said, I just want to know you. I want wisdom. I want to know you more about you. And he didn't say, I want money and I want fame and I want uh, uh, riches and, and all that. But because he didn't ask for those things, he got wisdom plus those things. But same with Bartimaeus. He didn't, he'd been begging all of his life. He'd been trying to scratch out an existence. But he didn't say, when, G, when God said, what do you want me to do for you? He didn't say, I want a big house. I want money. I want... Uh, uh, he was single-minded. He just wanted to be able to see. He wanted to be able to see the Lord. He, cause he could already see spiritually. He wanted to see the Lord Jesus physically. And the Bible says he received his sight. Now, back in verse number 32 of the same chapter. I'm sorry, not verse 32, verse 35. The Bible says, And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came unto him, saying, Master, what would thou... Uh, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. And he said unto them, What would ye that I should do for you? Same question. What do you want me to do for you? And 
James and John, their answers was totally different than Bartimaeus' answer. They said, we want to sit on thrones. We want glory. We want to be on your right hand in, in the kingdom. And the Bible says this was happening as they were walking in the way in verse 32. So well, they're walking in the way again. So then they're in the way. But you might be a Christian. You might be in the way. What do you? Jesus says to you, what do you want? Are you going to say something selfish like, give me money, give me success, give me this, that, or the other? Or are you going to say, I just want to see you. I just want to know you. And uh, then you can know, you can trust him. So he was, he was a self, this was a selfless desire that Bartimaeus had. And so he received his sight. And so once again, we notice the Lord Jesus, he didn't do this miracle to gain popularity or fame. He wasn't, he, you know, he, he used to always tell people, don't even tell others about what I've done for you. He was trying to get them, work on with them individually. Mm. And so uh, he, he didn't do it for that, but, but uh, he spoke kindly to Bartimaeus. He gave him his sight. Go, th he says, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. You know, and here's another act of irony. Jesus, is, uh, Jesus has just made this man free. He could choose to go anywhere he wanted to. Now, he'd been made free. He could see. Just imagine that moment when he could see. But... Uh, you know, he, don't, he doesn't need any helpers anymore. He doesn't have to beg anymore. He's, he's been made free from blindness. And yet, what does he do? The Bible says his first moment of freedom, he chose to follow Jesus. It says, and immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. He said, go thy way. But he said, I'm going to follow you in the way. Amen. You know, Amen. All of us. If you're a Christian here today, hopefully you know the Lord has set you free and you want to follow him in the way. Out of a thankful heart, that song is. There's a song that says, "He drew me, uh, he drew me with the cords of love, and thus he bound me to him." You know, he doesn't force us, but he he draws us, and we should be bound to him in thankfulness. He was set free from sin, and so now we should be willing to follow him all the days of our life. Amen. He's better than you could ever imagine. There was a man named William Montague Dyke, and when he was ten years old, he was blinded by an accident. Yeah, but this, despite his disability, he graduated from university and in here in England with high honors. But when he was in school, he fell in love with the daughter of a high-ranking British naval officer and became engaged. And so Mr. Uh, Dyke, his wedding was coming, and there were many guests who would be at this wedding because the, the naval officer was so famous. There was some royal guests even. There were cabinet members, distinguished men, and women of society assembled together to witness it. And uh, William's father, Sir William Hart Dyke, and the doctor, they were staying. There was a doctor standing there. Now, I forgot to tell you that this British officer, uh, who, who was his father-in-law, he had said to him, "There's a surgery that can make, I, that I believe can make, can restore your sight." He'd been talking about it with a, with his doctor, and so he had said, "Okay, I'll do the surgery, but we don't know if it's going to work or not." And so at the wedding, they performed the surgery, and at the wedding, he still was wrapped up. And they said, well, we should probably try this out first. He said, no, I want the first thing that I ever see to be my bride, to be my bride, if it works. And so the wedding day had arrived, all these guests were there, the, the, the royal people, everybody else, the, uh, his eyes were still bandaged, the organ started trumpeting the wedding march, and the bride came down, and as soon as she arrived at the altar, the, the surgeon took a pair of scissors and and out of his pocket, he cut the bandages from William's eyes. And everybody in the room was tense. Is, this, what's, is he going to be able to see? And they were holding their breath. And he said, you are, the most beautiful, you are more beautiful than I ever imagined. So he could see. Amen. And uh, Amen. she was more beautiful. And so one day, the bandages that are over our eyes will be removed. We're going to stand face to face with Jesus Christ. We're going to see him for the very first time. And it'll be more splendid than anything that we could have ever imagined mm. in this life. Come to the Lord Jesus. Don't put it off. Don't let anything put you off. Give him your whole life. Leap into his arms and he'll, he'll take you. Let's pray. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you so much for the, the, the lessons that we learned from Bartimaeus. Father, I pray that you'll help us all as we look into your word. And even in this very passage that we looked at this morning, that you'll open our eyes to some things in our own hearts. Father, I pray if there's any dark closets that are secret from you, that you'll open them up, that we'll all open them up, 
and uh, uh, welcome you in as you're passing by this morning in this message. Father, we, we pray for anyone listening who might not be saved. Father, I pray that they won't hesitate, that they'll realize that it's an amazing thing to come to Christ. Uh, Father, we thank you for this passage again that we've studied. We ask that you will speak to our hearts even now as we sing our final hymn and as we go about the rest of our day. And Father, we thank you so much for the Holy Spirit helping us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I can't think of any song more appropriate than what John Newton wrote there as, uh, as he was going blind there at that church. Page 236.